So now we're going to um, move on to um, a man who's got a sort of uh, a reputation not for being a disaster, but through um, being all over disasters. And uh, uh, he knows some really, really scary stuff. Um, he's been through quite a few subjects. You may have seen him presenting Horizon programs in the past. Um, but um, Bill McGuire is, is now specifically looking at um, one of the things which perhaps some voices in the climate debate have been perhaps looking to as a kind of get out of jail free card, and that's a large scale geo engineering. Um, and Bill's going to, I think, tell us a little bit about why we might want to think very carefully about that. Um, Bill is also going to be um, sharing um, some, some, uh, some slides. Um, so uh, do adjust your screen so that you get the best view possible. Over to you, Bill. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, well, I think this picture is what many people think of as uh, geoengineering, a huge army of mirrors in orbit around the planet reflecting solar radiation back into space. Um, in fact, it's an idea that uh, Edward Teller was rather fond of, and I think that tells you everything about geoengineering, that the father of the H-bomb and the putative um, inspiration behind Dr. Strangelove thinks it's a good idea, or thought it was, thought it was a good idea when he was alive. Um, next slide, please. I'm sure it's there somewhere. Uh -huh. um, geoengineering is sometimes thought to be about things like mirrors in space. Um, the, the reality is that there are many, many different varieties of geoengineering. Um, if you want to think about the definition, the Royal Society defines it as the deliberate intervention in the climate system to counteract uh, anthropogenic global heating. Um, and there's just some of them here. I hope you can see them uh, in some detail. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these. There are just too many. And I do note that it includes in geoengineering here uh, the planting of trees, which I must say I don't really regard as, uh, as being geoengineering at all. It's a perfectly normal activity, even if you carry it out on, a, on an enormous scale. Um, but as you can see, there are lots of different ways we can use technology to engineer the planet should we choose to do that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, under, really under the cover of COVID-19, we've seen um, quite a bit of support growing for various types of geoengineering. Um, it's also been growing in, in terms of credence, in terms of acceptability. Uh, and this has been driven not, I must say, by climate scientists, but generally speaking, by engineers, by physicists, and um, tech billionaires who seem to think this is a, a great idea, something to get involved with. They can, they can do their bit and save, save humanity and save the planet. Um, there are actually a number of UN moratoria in place to try and stop open air experiments um, in various areas of geoengineering. These are largely being ignored. So there are experiments ongoing. There are many experiments planned. Um, and they're in this, these one or other of these three areas, which really cover all geoengineering schemes. Um, probably one that's best known is solar radiation management. So that includes things like mirrors in space. It includes things like uh, trillions of reflect, tiny reflective sp spheres scattered around the stratosphere to reflect back like solar radiation. Uh, it includes things like cloud brightening and something I'll say a little bit more about later on, uh, generating an artificial volcanic eruption because we know that big volcanic eruptions cool the planet very effectively. Um, second, there's what's called earth radiation management. Um, and that's really about thinning cirrus cloud, thinning very high cirrus cloud and allowing uh, more of the heat generated at the Earth's surface by human activities to get out into space. And then carbon removal, there's all sorts of varieties here. There's obviously industrial carbon capture and storage. There's uh, the idea of biochar formation where you you, you burn wood to form charcoal, you bury it, so you're getting rid of the carbon that way. Um, also locking up carbon through various types of chemical reaction. Um, and I'll come on to that as well uh, in a little while. Uh, next slide, please. Now in terms of what's going on at the moment, the state of play, if you like, um, I just wanted to focus on two experiments which have had uh, a fair bit of publicity recently. One is actually ongoing, and that is a trial of cloud brightening over the Great Barrier Reef uh, of Australia. This is funded by the Australian government. Um, it's led by the Southern Cross University and others, and it involves 
spraying seawater into the atmosphere uh, at low levels, but turbulence carries it up so that it starts to contribute to cloud formation. And the tiny little specks of salt act as additional nuclei so that you have more um, tiny little droplets in, in the clouds that form and that makes the clouds brighter. It allows them to reflect solar radiation or a portion of the solar radi radiation back into space. Um, this is touted as simply being an idea to help the Great Barrier Reef, to help it survive, to help it uh, grow back again. But it's clearly, an, uh, uh, in, in some way at least, and I, uh, the idea is to develop this technology so that it can become more applicable on a much bigger scale. In other words, it's placing the Australian government and Southern Cross University and the collaborators, it's placing them in a position whereby they can sell this technology or they can develop it for wider use. Um, the second project is called Scopex. Um, it's led by Harvard University and others. It's been supported, at least in the past, by Bill Gates. Um, it's not up and running yet, but the plan is to launch a balloon into the stratosphere and to, to try spraying various substances and see what sort of effect they have on reducing incoming solar radiation. They're going to start off with, with water, um, go on to ground chalk, calcium carbonate, in other words, and then finally on to sulfur, which is um, sulfur dioxide is the gas pumped out by volcanic eruptions that does a great job in terms of reducing the input of solar radiation. Now, this hasn't got started yet. It's uh, supposedly imminent. Um, there is nothing in, in any of the moratoria that exists at the moment to stop this happening, but there's certainly a great deal of of um, concern about it because it sets a precedent uh, and it sets a precedent in re re relation to one of the most potentially most dangerous forms of geoengineering. Next slide please. So to lead on from that Scopex experiment, um, it really would build up to something uh, along the lines of pumping out a vast amount of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere something on the order of 20 million tonnes, which is the amount of sulphur dioxide pushed out by uh, the Pinatubo eruption in 1991, which was um, pretty much the largest of the last century. Uh, the idea would be to maintain those sorts of levels of sulphur dioxide until temperatures started to come down. Now, this is very different from a volcanic eruption. Pinatubo cooled the planet by about half a degree, but that was for a year or two. After that, the gases settle out and climate returns to normal. Um, here we're talking about maintaining very high levels of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere and the stratosphere for uh, as long as it takes effectively. There's been a number of pieces of research done on this that show that the uh, uh, result of that will be reduced crop yields by a number of percent, a significant reduction in crop yields for things like maize and rice uh, and wheat. And that's what happened in fact after Pinatubo worldwide. Um, this, this would also have an impact on regional precipitation and also on the efficiency of solar power generation, just when we need it most. Um, the other thing is that as a volcanologist, I know that past eruptions have had a, a devastating impact on weather patterns across the world, uh, including monsoons, uh, which clearly are critical for countries in Southeast Asia and parts of Africa. Um, if you can look at the 1815 eruption of, of Tambora, for example, which is arguably the biggest eruption in the last few thousand years, that led to widespread harvest failure and famine in uh, Europe. It killed many tens of thousands of people. It had wider ramifications in terms of affecting the monsoon. And it, in fact, led to the last great subsistence crisis in the Western world. So we know that real volcanic eruptions can be very, very deadly. And here uh, are some groups wanting to uh, simulate one of these and maintain those conditions for maybe years, maybe decades. Um, so clearly this is one of the riskiest schemes uh, of all the geoengineering um, plans that we have uh, being put forward at the moment. Next slide, please. Um, this, well, this would make me laugh if it wasn't so sad, really. We cut down 16 billion trees every year, 476 every second. And while we're doing that, geoengineers are proposing constructing forests of artificial trees um, to suck up the carbon that those trees we've cut down aren't sucking up anymore. Um, crazy, really. Uh, one study suggests 10 million artificial trees would be needed uh, to make a dent in 
uh, temperatures and they would cost something like $20,000 each. Um, huge emissions would be involved in their production, clearly. Um, installation of uh, artificial forests of millions and millions of trees would be massively disruptive, ecologically damaging, and um, in my personal opinion, uh, bonkers. Um, next slide, please. Now, there are different um, degrees of geoengineering, if you like. Some of them sound madder than others. And one very reasonable sounding one is, is, uh, is this one, which is uh, known as enhanced rock weathering. It involves uh, spreading rock dust, pulverized basalt is, is best, on the fields as a means of soaking up carbon via a chemical reaction. Um, clearly, if you, have, if you crush up a rock to form dust, you have a much bigger surface area and the rock, uh, those rock particles can become very effective at soaking up carbon by combination with minerals in the rock as the rock weathers. Um, it sounds very reasonable. It sounds, oh, it's not as disruptive, it's not as dangerous maybe as solar radiation management. But when you look at the figures, you realize what sort of scale this would have to be adopted on. Uh, you'd have to treat half of all the farmland in the world to capture just 2 billion tons of carbon a year, which is about a 20th of current emissions. Uh, and clearly that would require a staggering effort, a massive effort on a huge scale. It would be disrupted, it would be ecolog ecologically damaging once again, uh, and it would cause potential health problems in terms of the huge amounts of, of dust which would be blowing around the planet as a consequence. Next slide, please. Um, so that's a quick rush through geoengineering. I could have talked about many other schemes, but I didn't really want to um, clog up the works with all of those. So I've, I'm going to focus on the last couple of slides, um, in the last couple of slides, saying uh, why we, we shouldn't be doing this sort of thing or even considering it. Um, and it's a long list. Um, it might be worth pointing out here that a, a, a volcanology colleague uh, and climate scientist, Alan Robock, has 27 reasons why we shouldn't um, use solar radiation management trying to mimic a volcano alone. Um, so I'm not showing all those here, but I have some of the bigger, broader reasons why we shouldn't be doing this. First of all, all these fixes are, uh, as we know, untried and untested at the planetary scale. Um, many of them sound reasonable at small scale, but scaled up, they're going to be massively expensive, massively disruptive and or risky. They clearly have no guarantee of success. There's no warranty against unforeseen consequences. And uh, something which isn't often addressed, there are huge legal and human rights uh, issues here. Who gives the right uh, to anybody to alter the climate deliberately in my name or in anybody else's name? And that leads on to the fact that building a global consensus um, to do something, to, to take on board one of these geoengineering schemes on a planetary scale is going to be as hard as, as for getting major emissions cuts, if not more so. So, you know, this isn't going to be any easier to do. It's not going to be any easier to get everybody on board than, than the Paris Accord, for example. Next slide, please. Um, a few final points. If it's going to be, if we would, ha if we had to resort to some form of geoengineering, it could only operate in tandem with serious emissions cuts. Um, they can't work on their own. And that's particularly the case with solar radiation management, because if we uh, started to keep temperatures down artificially, but allow carbon to continue to build in the atmosphere, then if for some reason we had to turn off the solar radiation management scheme, uh, we would be in serious trouble with emissions levels uh, massively raised. Uh, on a broader scale, the very existence of geoengineering gives the impression that emissions cuts are not the last line of defense. And psychologically, I think that's critical. If you're fighting a battle, protecting a city and your family are there and you're the last line of defense, you will fight to the death. If you're the second to last line in defen of defense, uh, maybe psychologically you won't fight as hard. And I think that's really one of the most critical broad points against geoengineering. The fact that it turns heads and hearts away from cutting emissions as the science demands. It's a distraction, in other words. Um, it's sometimes touted as an insurance policy, but it's actually increasing risk taking. And this is typical of insurance policies. If your house is built on a floodplain um, and you can buy insurance, then that means you're taking a risk with your property that you're only taking because you have an insurance policy. 
In fact, the insurance is still allowing people, allowing governments, councils to build houses on floodplains, which they wouldn't otherwise do. So geoengineering, um, if, it, if it's regarded as an insurance policy, is actually increasing the risks that we face from messing with the climate. And I think, therefore, the bottom line is that geoengineering is a, is a putative backstop that solves nothing. And this isn't my phrase. This is, this is touted by everybody that argues against geoengineering. It's tackling the symptoms of um, climate breakdown, the symptoms of global heating. It's not tackling the cause. And just very finally, I couldn't give a talk without plugging my new eco-thriller novel, Sky Seed. If you want to know what really happens if you try and geoengineer the planet, then please can I recommend that to you. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Bill. And we love it when our um, world-leading 